Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. In this interview, you will learn about how two of the most experienced regenerative investors who have been investing in regenerative food systems, farmers and companies for the last almost 20 years are approaching a regenerative transition like the one on Benedict's farm. Welcome to Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. This is a special dedicated series on transition finance. Why are we recording this series? Many farmers are ready to speed up their regenerative transition. They've looked for learning, done the courses, read the key books, hosted the gurus on their farms, explored farm size regenerative designs, and most importantly, started their pilots and feedback loops. This is where transition finance is key. A local bank loan often isn't feasible because of the short duration, lack of flexibility, and the farmer's lack of collateral. Furthermore, there's a limit of how much equity a farmer is able or willing to give away. That is why my co-host aspiring to be regenerative farmer Benedict Beuzel and I are embarking on a journey to find out what are the key principles of transition finance for regenerative farmers. We are interviewing leading practitioners in the regenerative agriculture and food finance space. They share their insights how they would finance the speed up of the regenerative transition on Benedict's 1000 hectares, which is almost 2500 acres farm in Germany close to Berlin. This is an open process. We are sharing our lessons through the podcast episodes as we go along. We don't have the answers yet, just a lot of questions. So please share with us any examples of transition finance you've seen other inspiration, people to interview, etc. Get in touch via the contact page on the website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com. That is investinginregenerativeagriculture.com. So welcome to another episode in the Transition Finance Series. And today we're here with the founders of Shenaga Capital and the No Regrets Initiative, Sally Calhoun and Esther Park, which we both had on the podcast before, but never together. And it's the first time I think we're with four people. So I'm very happy to have Benedict Bezo back, obviously my co-host, and Sally and Esther. Welcome to you all on this March afternoon in a very crazy times in terms of the coronavirus. I don't know when people are going to listen to us, but we're definitely all in lockdown and dealing with these issues. So we might kind of spend a bit of time on that, but I'm very interested to dive deeper into transition finance and have you all here in this afternoon on the call. Great. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. And just a brief intro of our two guests. We have two guests on the call today, Benedict, so I'm very happy with that. And could you, for everybody that didn't listen to our early interviews, I will definitely link them below to briefly introduce yourself, Sally and Esther, so we have a, a short understanding before we dive into this interview, and then everybody should listen to the other ones, obviously. Okay, so my name is Sally Calhoun, and I uh, spent about 25 years in technology, and then almost 20 years ago ended up becoming a rancher in Central California. Since then, have been doing a lot of work on the ground around regenerating healthy ecosystems while producing food, fuel, and fiber, and then managed to get into impact investing and philanthropy around the same issues. And that whole effort uh, is called the No Regrets Initiative. And what about you, Esther? What brings you here today? Yes, I'm Esther Park. Um, I head up Cienega Capital, which is part of the No Regrets Initiative. And it's our private investing vehicle where we invest in regenerative agriculture enterprises. So that includes farms and food businesses. And obviously my co-host Benedict is on the call as well. Yes. Let me say that I'm really, uh, really excited, if not nervous, to have both of you on the call. Of course, you have been, you know, visionaries in the field and at the very forefront of, you know, not only taking a risk, but also having no regrets afterwards. I think that is really important. And I love the title of it. And you know, Kuhn, you just said it, we have a really tough time, really challenging time with regards to the COVID uh, or coronavirus. And then having, you know, those kind of figures as you are, Esther and Sally, that, that gives hope for all of us. So very grateful to have you guys on the call and looking forward to hear what, uh, what you can share with us from your experience. Yeah, so to dive in with that straight away, I've had the pleasure to meet both of you actually in person and, and also visit the farm and, and see 
a bit how you operate, but I would love to know how would you approach something in this case? Obviously, you're not financing anything outside the US, so it's not it's not a pitch. We're not pitching Benedict's farm, but let's say a farmer like Benedict, like farmer Benedict knocks on your door and uh, not in this case, virtually, obviously, because we cannot contaminate anyone, but knocks on the door and says, I'm, I'm operating this farm. I'm, I want to go faster. I want to transition. And my local bank has no idea what I'm doing. And I know some VC investors, et cetera, but they probably also don't really know what I'm doing. Plus, let's say their investment model is a bit tricky. What would be your first questions? What would be your first understanding to approach more, to understand more and to see to get a bit deeper into the case to see if it's something you might could work on from your initiative? Well, I guess I would ask, what does going faster mean? And what does that look like? And I would try to understand what kind of existing business and revenues are going on at the farm and see, you know, is there a clear line between what's going on today and what you plan or hope to have going on in the future? And so what does the acceleration of that line look like? What does that mean to you? What kind of financing do you think you need for that? And then we would just go into questions around the planning, the financial model, as well as just understanding his local situation and the markets that surround it. And you know, and I think that if it's a reasonable plan, what we would try to do is figure out what is the right financing that's appropriate for him. And that's kind of how we approach most of the things that we do. It's sort of starting with what is your context, what is your situation, and what is your plan? And then trying to find the right kind of financing, the form of financing that'll fit that situation. So depending on what it's for, you know, it could mean that there's a a debt investment, a loan of some kind, or, you know, if Benedict has some kind of operation where he might be aggregating product from multiple farms and selling under a common brand. There could be some kind of an equity play there. So it just depends. It depends on the business model, what's going on and what the financing is for. And I think the first thing, one of the first things Esther would say is don't spend too much time talking to the venture capitalists. Right. Yeah, <laughs> especially in this sector. <laughs> this is actually such an interesting part of the discussion. And I I often, you know, talk with people about it, not only investors, but people who are into farming or people who are close to farming. And because we always say, how can we scale regenerative technologies? How can we scale regenerative agriculture? Right? And I think one of the key, let's say, difficulties is, and uh, Sally, I would really like to know how you see that, is that there is quite a few, that the uncertainty of it is still very large especially if it's not so strongly basically aggregating products from around other farms and then having a like a an easy to go with business model let's say but actually to say i want to regenerate the land i want to change the regime of treating the land it is supposedly going to soil health you know and i will need a, a time of five six seven maybe ten years in which i will have to change you know the whole setting basically the whole philosophy so there is like this vision on one side where there's just so much uncertainty and on the other side you have a financial model and a plan and i mean i can't do that i've been in investment banking beforehand i know how to tweak the numbers so to say <laughs> but having those two realities in a sense and and where is the truth and how open or not how open but how can you somehow find the right mix which you want to be you know responsible about if it's if you're taking on a third party uh, money of, of of a third party, and like how do you, uh, Sally, from a sort of the visionary point of view, how would you go about that, or what would be your approach? So, as I think you're right, there's this tremendous uncertainty. None of us have any idea how this really turns out at scale, or how we can make this happen. But maybe it's just that the uncertainty here is more obvious than it is in a lot of places. Um, you know, maybe we are we are less willing to hang our hats on some spreadsheet that's been finagled than a lot of other people are. I and mean, if you look at venture capitalists, they assume that at least 50% of their companies will just fail. 40% will probably not do well. So they're taking this huge risk, but unfortunately in our society, then we want this giant return, possibility of return in exchange. But I mean, Esther and I often say that we, we think that the perception of return, financial return is of market rate is higher than it actually is, even in the market. So I, I think it's, 
right now, I think you have to find investors who are willing to look more broadly at return and take social return and ecological return along with financial return. I don't honestly have any idea how we get the whole world, the whole investment world to feel that way. I sort of think that basically we are like starting a little snowball, the investors who are willing to do this now. And it's going to take probably not investment capital to scale this. It's going to take the world realizing that this is as important as the trillion dollars we're about to spend on the coronavirus in the United States. And that as a society, we're going to have to, that's how we're going to scale societally because society can look at all those different returns. So that's not a particularly great answer for someone looking for financial backing at this point in time, but that's kind of, that's the best answer that I can come up with. I don't, I don't really know how investors um, scale this given the uncertainty, the time required, and the relatively small financial return that's linked to ecological return at this point in time. Right. I mean, this, I, I feel you, this is exactly what I believe, to be honest with you, but my more sort of critic friends or critic farmers or, or visitors who are more critical about this, they would say, and there's a lot of honesty and truth to that, that, you know, saying, well, social and ecological capital, I mean, it's good and we all want it and we need it. But in the end of the day, it has to be obviously economically viable. And we all believe that it is. And I think there's farmers all over the world who are showing that it is economically viable and quite well. But Esther, like, what would you say, you know, coming more from the sort of investment angle, what is your approach about that, um, do you think we can actually see a change basically in a potential financial product that says, well, you know, on a time span of like maybe 10 years, we will have three or four years that we already basically discount in a way that we know there, there might be a crisis and there might not be an annuity being paid. So how do you see the flexibility of financial products with regard to, you know, what we're trying to achieve? Yeah, I think that um, the you can build in flexibility into financial products. We do it all the time. I think what the real flexibility that needs to happen is in the mind and in the frameworks that we think about things, you know, because we talk about, you mentioned scale, how do we scale this thing? Well, you know, we have scaled traditional agriculture and look at how that turned out, right? Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that we talk about is scaling across as opposed to scaling up. So how mm -hmm. can we take models of people who are doing this well and doing it, you know, in a financially viable way? And how can we replicate that across regions and climates and soil types and all of those kinds of things? And there's one farmer in particular I remember talking to who said, actually, he wants to be able to try to do more on fewer acres. So he actually wants to shrink his operation, but he thinks he can actually produce more and create more revenue on fewer acres. So that was a really interesting concept to me about thinking differently about how you can scale an operation or you know, what is this concept of scale? Why do we need it? What we actually want and what we actually need is more people on the land doing these types of practices and being in relationship with nature and our ecology and our food system rather than you know bigger operations with fewer people. So I think we're trying to think about risk and scale and return a little bit differently in terms of, you know, and then just in terms of financial return, why, why is it that we can't ever lose any money, right? The assumption is you can't ever fail, you can't ever lose money. And the fact is, that never happens in life. <laughs> we can see that at the, the public stock exchange the last weeks, right. which all and the models, yeah. If you want to talk about market rate of return today, that market rate of return is negative 50, 60, 70. I mean, that's that's what we're looking at right now. And I, I was telling Sally the other day that I remember having to respond to the 2008 crash. And that was just 12 years ago. Are we going to have to go through this every 10 years? You know, is this the cycle that we're going to see ourselves in? In which case... I would say the net on that is zero in terms of financial return. So what are we really talking about? What are we tr really trying to go for and achieve with what we're trying to invest our money in? Mm -hmm. I think we need to think about that a bit differently. It's interesting. You said that people say, ah, ecological capital, social capital, that's great. But it'll be interesting to see a few months from now what, whether people are so cavalier about social capital, for example. 
right? I think we, it really takes a crisis to whack us all in the head to see that there are things besides the financial world that drive people and the planet. Yeah. For example, being in a supermarket and not seeing any vegetables or any, any animal products and mm -hmm. suddenly realize and think, oh, I might have a farmer nearby that may be actually, oh, I remember they are selling something directly. Maybe I can, uh, having access in the pre-call, we were discussing that being grateful for having access to food is something mm -hmm. we completely forgot because it was always there. It always showed up magically, like poof, on the shelf. And there was no, even a question, maybe the broccoli was sold out once in whatever amount of years. And now everything, at least here in Europe, in many places, is just not there. And it will get there and nobody's going to starve, but it's a very strong wake up call, not even to talk about the quality of the food. but. And I think there's even one uh, additional part of that argument, like farmers, especially in Germany in the last couple of months, you know, they have really had a tough time because you had all sorts of groups of people going on the street and saying, we don't agree with this and we don't agree with that. And we want you to do more sustainable and more biodiversity and things like that. And many try to do it as good as they can. Right. So I think also a sort of a self appreciation of the farmers themselves now is picking up because of it, because people are approaching them in a different way. So this has a nice social element on the farmers lives because suddenly they feel like, wow, you know, this is actually my business or my, my job basically is, is, is relevant for the system. Um, so I think that appreciation that is now arising, um, you know, that goes into, goes into both ways. And just to follow up on the, no, go, go ahead, Esther. Well, I was just going to say one of the things that I've heard Sally say is that, you know, in the middle of the country here in the U.S., in the Midwest, most farmers don't grow food for people. A lot of that is for animal feed or export or, you know, um, fuel, highly manufactured food-like products, <laughs> ingredients, but not actual food. And so it's interesting now in this time for people to have to think about, well, how can I get closer to the source of my food to be able to even just get it, right? So I can't go to the store and get eggs because they're all gone, but hens lay eggs every day, right? So then it makes me think, where are there hens laying eggs and where can I go find them? And so it suddenly starts me thinking now, where does that actually happen and how can I get closer to that source? Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm very curious how much of this is going to stick and how much of this interest and, and hopefully, let's say through great taste and great experiences with local farmers or with your local farmers, because whatever local you can find, some of that will stick and create a, a stronger connection. And to come back, you mentioned, I, I wrote down the word flexibility. You can build that into something you said. And I, do you have any experiences? Because the flexibility in terms of, in times of this enormous shocks, which we'll see more often and happen more often, seems to be very, very important in finance, but seems to be very missing usually. You said, yeah, but actually you can easily, or I don't think you said easily, you can build that in. Do you have any examples of where the flexibility has been built in into the investments you've made to basically put you as an investor on the same side as the entrepreneur slash farmer instead of just on the other side of the table? Sure. I mean, we look very closely at cash flow. And so many times when we're doing a loan, particularly, I'm looking very closely at cash flow. And so I will build in certain structures that make sense for that cash flow. So sometimes I'll say, hey, it looks like based on your projections, you won't be able to make any payments to us for the first 12 or 18 months because you're going through an investment period. You're not going to be making any money. There's not going to be any cash flow. So we'll just give you a bit of a grace period. And sometimes I'll pad it, right? So you say it's 12 months. I might say it's 15 or 18 months just to give you a little bit of extra leeway because always the unexpected happens, right? Or in some cases, particularly with farmers, you know, they're very seasonal. So you can pay me twice a year in July and December or whatever it might be according to their production schedule. So, uh, you know, or if it makes sense, you know, there's one lump payment per year, depending on the nature of their business and how they're doing. So we, we try to build as much of that flexibility in as possible from the outset. But a lot of our flexibility actually comes after we've made the loan or the investment where we said, okay, things have not turned out the way that we thought it would. 
but let's reassess and let's renegotiate the terms of this loan. So we're, you know, we're in that relationship, we're in that communication with the entrepreneurs and trying to make it work as best for them as possible. And do you see that as a, like, as a modus of operating that everyone should do, or if it's, is it because we're so much in the pioneering phase that it, it does require like a, a specific way, like a very, um, very specific way on every case, or at some point, is it going to be more standardized? And, and if we want to, to use the word again, scale or replicate this over hundred thousands of farmers, how would that work in the future? Are there going to be standard flexible, which is sort of a contradiction? How do we do that with a lot of these individual cases, which are very different? Maybe there are going to be a lot of Midwest farmers knocking on your door in the next weeks because they want to switch from fuel to something to food, and they're going to all require a different, a different approach. Yeah, I, I would hope that we could figure out some kind of standard flexibility, <laughs> um, if, if that's not an oxymoron. But uh, yeah, I think what it really just takes is not trying to fit in a box all the time. You know, it actually takes a mindset of thinking outside the box. And I think we just we need more people who can think that way. So I'm actually part of a um I think going on its third year initiative called the Integrated Capital Institute um, that was started by RSF to basically cultivate more people who can think differently about financing and financing structures. So hopefully we'll brainwash enough investors to start thinking <laughs> in this way. Inspire, inspire. Let's okay, use inspire. <laughs> I mean, I, I think one of the issues, if you look at the Midwest, is so there is all this like this variability, particularly in farming. And what we did at starting in the Great Depression, right, was we put federal programs in place to even all of that out. So we put in crop insurance and we put in crop subsidies and they are flexible, right? Your crop insurance kicks in if you're de- your uh, crop is destroyed by hail, but what it allowed is it allowed the finance system to become completely inflexible because they had this sort of base guaranteed return in agriculture. And so societally, we, we took all of that risk and we still do through crop insurance. So it's not like the risk is not there for those bankers who are inflexible. They've just, we've come up as a way to minimize their risk and to make things look not risky, which really are. And so I guess the question is just who, who's going to take the risk going forward? Yeah, we removed it. Yeah, yeah it's a, that's a great point, actually. And I think it's so important to have those kind of examples because, you know, the kind of language that you use in the story that you tell is so, so has such a huge part of, of developing, you know, or basically inspiring people to go or, or follow you or, or are open to being part of, of that process. So that I think that was great. But one thing I also wanted to, you know, just have an opinion of you guys is a problem that I'm being seeing here um, in Germany, at least, is that we have a huge lack of independency. So there is all the farmers are already stuck in the system. They have made huge investments. They have done a big stable. They have done this. They have done that. They are very specialized. So getting out of the system is one thing. It depends on on where you are, if you can do it or can't, or if it will take a bit longer or a bit less, but also going out there through additional investments, through additional debt is always difficult in a way because they are already have a lot of debt, you know, they don't have a good cash flow. They are already, you know, in huge investment processes or, or spheres. So I think finding and building independency for farmers, I think is for me one of the key tasks or key things that we have to make sure of. And the question is, how do we get there if the cash flow is low, if debt is high, and you know, you don't want to make them any more investments. So any thoughts on, on that situation? Well, it's a question that we think about quite a bit because we need more farmers to transition to regenerative practices. And we frankly find to your experience, Benedict, that farmers are stuck they're very stuck in in the current system that they're in. They're stuck with the types of subsidies and crop insurance and existing debt that they have around this. We haven't yet sort of thought about how to address existing debt, but one of the things that I have found in talking to farmers who are doing regenerative practices 
if they haven't been doing it from the beginning, it took a major crisis for them to change their practices. They essentially went bankrupt, mm-hmm. right? In which case, when you go bankrupt, then you know you you sort of you discharge your obligations, and in a way, you're able to wipe the slate clean and start over. But many of those folks faced that situation, and that allowed them and gave them the freedom to change. It also sort of forced their hand to think about things differently. So we've been thinking about and experimenting with just conversations with partners in different regions around how can we help farmers so stuck in the traditional paradigm start to move. And one of the things that we've been doing on the philanthropic side of our work is funding some work around a new crop insurance product. So could there be crop insurance for folks who are doing things differently, who are implementing what we call conservation practices, Mm -hmm. who are cover cropping and building diversity into their rotations and, you know, reducing tillage and things like that. So what if we could build something in the existing subsidy market that would reward practices that are more regenerative to help people make that transition? So there are things like that that we're talking to some folks about and trying to put a little bit of money towards as well. I think the elephant in the room is always... um the general financial situation of farmers. There's an economist named Ken Meter who works in the United States, and I first saw him a few years ago, and he basically said that the return on investment for farming in the United States is negative. Look at any state, look at any county, look at the entire country, it's all negative. So I sometimes get snarky when people say, but how will you make money practicing regenerative agriculture? It's like, I don't know, the same way everybody else does. (laughs) I think it's a, I always joke, but it's not a joke. Like find me a, a, a profitable, for sure I'm getting emails now, but find me a profitable farmer without, in this case in Europe, the subsidy system or some kind of outside payment coming in or a partner working off farm and looking at the number of hours that go into it. Like it's a very, we, we have this illusion. I think you're absolutely right that the, the extractive guys and girls are making so much money and we have to compete with that. No, it's actually an illusion of return that, that is not there, but unfortunately, it's the story that we keep telling ourselves that the extractive version is generating so much returns. Yes, for the input companies, but not necessarily for for the farmers, or probably necessarily not for the farmers. I think the other part of that illusion that's helping investors not be able to see this is the price of land. So you're a REIT, a real estate investment trust. You invest in agricultural land, and you make a ton of money. That's just because the underlying value of the land, mostly around speculation, went up. It's not because you made a ton of money farming. So. It's completely disconnected from the production value or the potential production of, of the land. Um, yeah, I mean, Sally, because you mentioned it, I mean, the, that whole discussion on, you know, how do we actually treat the land and who are we actually supposedly meant to own land? Does that actually work? Is land not a public good and we're like the shepherds of it? Maybe, you know, so that whole financing part, how can we get young people or how can we get any people really who want to on the land, work the land, you know, get in touch with it, build that relationship, that trust, grow food. Like this is such a big part of that whole discussion, right? Because like land prices today are so high, you cannot buy it if you're a farmer. There is just no way. So how can we solve that? I mean, that's really tough. And it's such a fundamental question, right? So. Yep. Got, I'm speechless on that one. I, I... (laughs) Don't say that. Oh, come on. So, I mean, I think there's some local solutions to that. For example, I think that Mm -hmm. in California, there's a tremendous amount of public land and there's a tremendous amount of conservation land, all at least all over the United States. And that has been conserved and turned no longer working landscapes in a lot of cases. So one first step, hopefully, that we're working on in California with a number of partners is to turn that public land back into working landscapes to kind of change this notion of conserving, which means closing the gate and kicking the people off and thinking more about that land, which is publicly owned for the public good, for the public benefit differently. Now, that's a pretty specific solution depending on where you are, but I think that does have potential in some places to change the thinking around that. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of work being done on the ownership discussion on trusts on when retirement comes and how to then sort of take the land off the market instead of selling it for speculation and making sure it, it's then governed in a different way and basically never to be sold again but still obviously farmed very regeneratively which is a very difficult and long process but very interesting as more of that land comes 
as long as it's governed and, ma and managed well, obviously, but it's a very tricky one. And some people call it a huge bubble as most of the land is used for fuel and for feed, not for food. If that collapses at some point, what will happen with all that land? So there's also the, the, the notion and the illusion of, I see many people keep buying land and sort of imagine it will always go up. I mean, nothing will always go up. So there's going to be a shock on that. I don't know where it comes from. Could be fake meat, could be wherever, but that the notion that the land prices will always go up is also, it's a very, I think a very tricky way to build your, your fund thesis or, or something like that. And clearly the problem is not that there's money. What did Impossible Foods raise $500 million last week? <laughs> wow, I missed that. But What's the probability? There's enough money, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That being said, Esther, I have a question with that in that regard as well. Because have you had any contact or is there any movement uh, with regards to reinsurance companies in the U.S.? Because those companies have all the risk, right? If there's anyone really thinking progressively about health, public health, about soil, about climate, I mean, it's the reassurance companies, right? And they have, I mean, they have money, right? They have capital. So I was wondering, is, is there not an argument to basically start a discussion with, with them as well and say, look, guys, if you want to, you know, be somehow on top of the risk that, that is going to come, let's talk about land use, right? So any thoughts on that? Any movement there in the U.S.? I have not seen any movement on that particular front. I think where we're starting to see some movement is on the human health side. Mm -hmm. So the health insurance carriers, you know, are starting to see that preventive care is a huge cost savings. And so to the extent that they can help people eat healthier, to the extent that they can give them access to more nutrient-dense foods, um, it seems worthwhile to them. So there are some health insurance companies here in the U.S. that are starting to think about the connection to food and how it's produced. We also have been in touch with some people in the medical field, you know, and particularly people in the medical field who work with farm workers. They're very concerned about their health and about the environmental conditions that they find themselves in. Um, oft oftentimes they're very toxic depending on the kinds of chemicals that are being used on those farms. And so I think from the medical health perspective, we are starting to see some movement and that's where it's happening. I'm not really seeing it happen in the mainstream insurance industry yet. Very interesting. And I actually want to ask a question to Benedict because Esther brought up a nice one. So what does going faster and scale mean to you? And I, we, we've had those discussions in our, our, our first interview, which I will also link below with your vision, obviously for the farm and for the estate as a platform, but why do we keep discussing scale on, on the interviews we're doing here and going faster with, uh, with your regenerative transition? Well, that is indeed a good question. Um, I have to give you that. But, and there's, I mean, there's a couple of answers to that, to be totally honest with you, depending from which angle I want to approach it. As of now, as of, and I, like, if you ask me in this particular time right now, it's basically just, you know, getting up the numbers of the cows that we have, right? We started with a little group of cows last year to get some first experience to do the mistakes that you do to get some understanding of, of the movements and, and the processes and the things that you need and the risks and whatever. We've done that now. I have a bit of a, or we have a bit of a, a better understanding of what we're trying to do at the moment, but really to get that additional, you know, value add the ecosystem function, you know, the get up the soil health, actually have the cow be out there and actually help us also bringing down the cost by basically, you know, doing the job that we today would be doing by buying manure and then bringing it out uh, mechanically. I would need a, a lot of more cows. So I could basically just buy, let's say, 150, 200 cows, depending on, on, on how I want to go. And that would be a big step, right? And, and with that comes some investment into infrastructure and building fences and all that. I think that would be something that would be the most immediate benefit and the most big step, let's say. And then uh, I think apart from that, there's a couple of other things that, that you can do as well. I mean, because today... As we are very grain dominated, we have a very tight, let's say, grain production. So basically deciding to take out some of the acreage to actually have, let's say, a cover crop, a perennial cover crop for the cows to get on there, but then incorporate that into basically the, the regime to, if I go with, um, let's say, um, spelt, which is something that we actually can earn a lot of money with, 
then, you know, I'm harvesting five tons per, per hectare and not three tons because I have actually managed to, to increase the soil to actually put in the nitrogen through the cows together with the cover crops. These are steps and, and certain risks that I, I cannot take at the moment because we had two large droughts last year. Um, if something is happening like this again, you know, it's kind of life-threatening. We have a lot of employees and responsible for those families as well as for my own family. So these are basically simple first steps in a way and simple, obviously. <laughs> let's, let's see, it's, it's complicated as it is. And then additionally to that, there's a couple of other things that we can do basically, right? Um, start, you know, agroforestry systems or, or, or rows on, on huge fields. So, you know, we have fields that are 80 hectares. I mean, think about erosion, soil erosion through rain, through wind. So things that we can do there. Obviously, the whole machine park that you could adapt towards more regenerative methods. I mean, there's still certain areas that we're plowing. I would love, obviously, to sell the plow, right? But, you know, first of all, I have to make sure that, you know, the people are working with us they understand why and they they under, they want to go this way as well. So it takes some time to convince them of that, maybe a new way that they haven't been used to. I think that's really critical. And at the same time, if we, you know, ditch the plow and say, well, we'll do it, everything different now, we will have a couple of years and depending on, on the weather, obviously, where we will have a, a large dip in, in, in the income. So these are things that, you know, you could speed up, obviously, as well. So I think, you know, it's a couple of different things, actually. It's, it's really a few. Um, Is that something you hear? I mean, obviously, it's a very different climate, a very different country where, where Benedict's operating. But is that a similar, something similar you've heard before or like a similar approach you that is common also in the U.S.? Absolutely. I mean... <laughs> I think one of the things that we've learned at the Piscinus Ranch is that we can only go as fast as nature is willing to go with us. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a lot of things that we'd love to see happen faster um, on the land and in the soil. But, you know, it's sort of we're doing everything that we can and we just have to cooperate with nature and she's going to tell us <laughs> how fast this can happen, how fast the regeneration can happen. But, you know, definitely in terms of investment of things like livestock and weathering, you know, some of the tougher environmental things. I mean, here in the middle of our country, you know, the farmers suffered pretty drastically the last couple of years because of too much rain. So they weren't able to get the crops in when they needed to. They weren't able to harvest it when they needed to. There was just a lot of delays that they suffered um, and a lot of losses that they suffered because of extreme weather events related to our climate. So, you know, those are all things that, that we're very familiar with, with hearing. And I think that, you know, again, kind of like in this time, I'm, I'm hoping that my theory around um, resilient food systems is going to prove out around local and regional. But I also believe that in the long term, that your, your farm and your agricultural system will be more resilient to these events as you continue to nurture and improve the soil. So that's a theory. And I think that, you know, we're willing to go with people through a certain extent, the tough times to be able to sort of come out on the other side with more resilience on the land. And, and did you see an increase because of these tough times for, like say, many farmers in, in the U.S., an increase of people reaching out to you that, that were getting close to that crisis moment that you described before? Is, that a, is there an uptake? Is there more more energy around uh, let's say soil and, and region or are we still too early to to tell well we haven't seen it because the traditional farmers that are feeling like they need something different don't know about us so we haven't been hearing from them but we have been hearing from the people around them that do know us so you know people who work either in government or technical assistance or other kinds of organizations that surround the farms they're telling us these people need help they need to learn more about this they need access to experts um, and to financing and so that we've been hearing and i think that it's probably too early today to say here's what we're doing to actively address that but we are in multiple conversations with folks around what is needed to help support the transition for these farmers because you know a lot of them 
I mean, we're, we're seeing here in this country unprecedented rates of suicide among farmers. Um, just financially, they can't figure out how to make it anymore. And I think that with, again, the weather events, like it's just increased um, fragility of these farming operations. I mean, I think you, you, we heard about it in Iowa, for example, when there's all this presidential campaigning four years ago, that climate change was not an issue. Farmers don't want to talk about climate change. Apparently this year I wasn't in Iowa, but what you hear is that there's pretty much consensus that the climate is changing. We might still argue about why, but it, there's, so there seems to be, we're now at the point where at least we're maybe getting a consensus among farmers in the middle of the country that they have to do something differently. So. Well, sometimes I have the feeling that, you know, there's so much potential that lies within changing a routine, that lies within innovating on the farm, innovating with the farmers and helping them also in the transition phase and bringing in young people because all those different problems can be combined into a solution, right? For example, I have this really talented young guy from Belgium and he is deeply into composting methodologies and all different composting from vermicolor culture through Johnson Sioux and everything you basically know. And he would like, and this is something we cannot do. We don't have that know-how here. He would like to stay here on the farm, basically be an entrepreneur on his own, but on our farm, right? And we obviously would love to facilitate that, but he would need roughly 30,000 euros per year for maybe two or three years in order to test those composting forms to do a compost tea, to apply it on different plots, to basically do all the, the research that you have to do on the ground here with the biomass that we have, to afterwards say, look, this is the way that is specifically good for your farm. This is something you can, tran can transition into, and these are the investment costs, and this is what you need, and then you can basically start. But you have basically the, the proof that has been basically derived on your farm, right? And I think this is a model, basically having young people who are also entrepreneurs at the same time on your farm that basically help you transition into that kind of way without having too much financial risk on it, right? So have, and it's not that much money if you think about it like that, especially if you find an, an elegant way that the farmer or yeah, the farmer doesn't have to pay for it uh, him or herself. So I think there's huge potential to just, you know, motivate and inspire and bring in young people who then help farmers transition. And I think that's, yeah, could be one of the many solutions that we have. Absolutely. And we have done some grant making on the philanthropic side for some of those kinds of projects. Yeah. I think it fits great with the farm as a platform, which we discussed previously uh, in other interviews, like how to to open it up and really use it, uh, the, the biomass as a platform and the space as a platform and obviously the connections mm -hmm. and resources and really switching that mindset from this is a farm with a big gate around and that's it, but it's actually an ecosystem. So just to be conscious of everybody's time, I want to thank you, first of all, um, I always end with a final question, which never is a final question, but some final advice for Benedict and myself, but mostly for Benedict in this journey on transition finance is there any language we should use? Is there any way we can communicate better and more effectively with people that could potentially fund? And I use fund in not just investor, but also on the grant side, a lot of the things that need to happen and we would like to see happening on the farm and definitely using the farm as a platform over the next years. Any words of wisdom from definitely the field you, you have been operating in for, for quite a while? Well, I guess I would just say, you know, I would just encourage you to, to keep going. I mean, in terms of financing, obviously, I think the world has not quite caught up <laughs> to you yet. But, I, you know, Sally and I are doing a lot of work to try to set a good example. We are trying to inspire other investors and philanthropists to do more of this work and to do it with the frame of thinking that we're using. So we're hoping to try to build the field around you. So to the extent that you can be patient and come alongside, I think that, you know, eventually we're going to need you and we do need you. So don't give up. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say. And I, and I think the encouraging part is that in just in the last couple of years, people are realizing that things have to change. I really do feel like that in the world, there's a realization that we have to manage this land differently. I think we're still stuck at the, yes, we want it to be different, but we don't want to pay for it point. 
But I do think the explosion of interest, the explosion of understanding is going to make a difference. I just have no idea when. But I think if we've learned nothing in the last week, it's that things that looked impossible are actually possible. And that if the world wants to do something, we can mobilize an incredible amount of humanity and financial resources. I mean, who would have thought the Republicans would be talking about a trillion dollar aid package in the United States? So I think we can't assume that because we're here today, we can't get here. I think we just can't see how it happens now. There's no rational, logical path, but it's probably going to happen somehow, faster maybe than we ever imagined. So yeah, hang in there. Yeah, I mean, the, I, this was uh, one of the most beautiful uh, sentences I've I've heard in a long time, and I, I totally agree. But I, I hope you guys realize that by saying that, all the uh, responsibility lies in your hands now, right? You have to pave the way. <laughs> and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I think it lies more in your, as much in your hands as in our hands. <laughs> well, I won't give up, that's for sure. <laughs> and to have you on my back, it's even better. <laughs> Thank you so much, all three. And we'll definitely be checking in. Obviously, we're continuing with the series, but also it would be good at some point to do an update when the dust settles a bit on the No Grats initiative and see where you're at. Because as I checked, it was three years ago that I interviewed Sally and it was two years ago, actually plus a month, that I interviewed Esther. So it's more than over time, more than due for an update. But there will be there will be another episode. Thank you so much for listening and I see you next time. Thanks. Thank you for listening to this episode, which is part of the Transition Finance series, trying to find appropriate transition finance to speed up regenerative agriculture on farms. For feedback, ideas, suggestions, please contact us through Twitter or via the contact page on the website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com. Please share this episode with a friend and give us a five-star rating, which really helps others to find the podcast. All the episodes of the series can be found on the website and in your podcast app. Thank you and see you next time. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. 
It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.